Are you concerned about your performance on the AP Stats free response questions? These questions are no joke. With six questions in 90 minutes, every second counts. But don't worry. Today I'm going to show you exactly how to approach it, exactly how to manage your time, and exactly how to maximize your score. The free response section is structured in a certain way, so knowing this can give you a huge advantage. Let's break it down. Now there's gonna be six questions and 90 minutes to complete all six questions. It's gonna be broken into two parts. Part A is gonna have questions one through six. That's 37.5% of your free response score. You'll have 65 minutes for that part. Part B, question six, known as the investigative task, you'll have 25 minutes for that question. Now, before we get into actually understanding the questions, I just want to remind you that you are allowed to use the formula sheets and tables on the free response section. This is included with the exam, so make sure you're familiar with what's on there and how to use it. So let's break the questions down. Typically, the questions are going to follow this order, where the first question is going to be a data analysis, followed by collecting data, then question three, probability and sampling distributions. Number four is typically going to be an inference question, and number five is a question that's going to have multiple concepts involved in it. Number six is the investigative task. This one's always a little bit different, so I want to break that down for you first. The investigative task which is part B, you'll have 25 minutes for this one. It's going to assess multiple skill categories and content areas, so it covers a wide range of concepts. It's going to focus on the application of skills and content in new contexts or in non-routine ways. So often you will see questions on the investigative task for things that you have not learned in statistics, but you have enough information and understanding to be able to walk through the question and they will give you enough guidance. Here I have a screenshot of the directions, just one question, but it's gonna have multiple parts. Also, with the free response questions, you don't have to go in order. So some students like to have a different strategy for this. Other students like to look through the questions briefly first, pick the ones that they know they can answer, then go back and work on the other ones. One big common mistake that students make is not showing enough work. Right here in the directions, it says, show all work. Even if a question does not specifically ask for you to show your work, make sure you're showing your work. Responses with no work won't receive full credit, even if you have the right answer. This is often an issue on probability questions. The next tip I have for you is don't get too fancy. Remember, actual people are going to be reading and scoring your exam. Make sure you're not using different colors on a graph and expect the reader to be able to interpret it. They may be getting just a black and white scanned copy of your exam. Don't waste time erasing. It's hard for AP readers to determine what's erased and what's not erased, what's lit written lightly. Instead, cross out your wrong answers and draw arrows to help AP readers follow your work. Now, let's talk about how to approach your answers to make sure you're hitting all the right marks. There are a few key things to keep in mind to make sure you communicate clearly and get the best score possible. Let's go ahead and break it down. First, read the question carefully. Make sure you're answering exactly what's asked. It's easy to miss small details, so make sure you take your time. Next, watch your vocabulary and symbols. Misusing terms like bias or confounding can hurt your score. It's better to explain things clearly than to rely on statistical jargon. Also, avoid using symbols like sigma or p-hat without the numbers substituted in. Show your work with real numbers. Next, give a complete answer. AP readers can't fill in the gaps for you. They can't do your thinking for you. Give enough detail so that they can accurately score your response. Even if it seems obvious, remember, the clearer, the better. On the flip side of that, don't over explain things. Stick to answering what's asked. Don't feel like you need to fill all the space on the paper. Sometimes there's going to be more space than is necessary to answer the question. So don't feel like you're doing something wrong if there's additional space on the paper after you've finished completing your response. And finally, keep everything in context. Make sure you include the variable names and the group names to help frame your answer. Remember, context makes it clear what you're talking about, and often there are points associated with giving the correct 
full and complete context. Let's talk about how to handle data analysis questions. These questions come up a lot, so it's important to know what graders are looking for. First, when you're describing a distribution, make sure to mention shape, center, variability, and outliers, and always include the, include the variable name for context. Next, if you're comparing distributions, use comparison phrases like greater than or about the same. Describe the shape and unusual features for each group and don't just list them. Actually compare them. Use both variable and group names. Also, if you're interpreting the slope or y-intercept from a regression line, make sure you're using non-deterministic language like predicted when describing trends and so you're phrasing it not as guarantees. Also, if the question says to calculate and interpret, make sure you're doing both. A great tip is to circle the word and in the directions so you don't forget. And last, never say that a distribution is normal. It's only ever approximately normal. And don't make that call from a box plot because box plots don't show peaks or gaps. Now let's go over some data collecting questions. These often trip students up, so here's what to watch for. First, don't mix up the vocabulary. Stratifying is for sampling, while blocking is for experiments. Don't switch those around. Also, use the right term for the right context. Next, if the question asks you to choose between options, be sure to explain why you picked the one you picked and why you didn't pick the other ones. And also, if you're asked to describe a method for random selection or assignment, be specific. Say whether it's with or without replacement and include how you would do it, whether it's a random number generator, a random digits table, or slips of paper. And yes, if you use slips of paper, don't forget to mention that you'll shuffle those. Next up, probability questions. These can feel tricky, but here's how to handle them with confidence. First, always show your work. Even if the answer feels obvious, you need credit for your method, not just your final number. Next, for random variable questions like normal, binomial, or geometric, make sure to define the variable, state its distribution, and write a probability statement that includes the boundary and direction. And for normal distributions, draw a clear labeled graph. Also, if you use your calculator, be sure to write out the full command with labels, not just what you simply enter into the calculator. Also, be specific about which distribution you're talking about, the population, or the sample, or the sampling distribution of a statistic. Don't just say the distribution. If you're stuck on an earlier part, make up a reasonable value so you can keep going. Just remember, probabilities must be between 0 and 1. And don't quit. Sometimes the last part might be the easiest. And if you use a wrong answer from a previous part, but use it correctly in the next part, you will earn credit for the correct use of that incorrect answer. Let's talk about inference questions now. These show up every year and there's a pretty good chance you'll have to do a full procedure, so here's how to approach them. If the question asks you to construct and interpret a confidence interval or to decide if data provide convincing statistical evidence, that's your signal to do a full four-step inference procedure. Remember that state, plan, do and conclude. Use those labels in your responses. It's going to help you stay organized and helps the reader follow your thinking. Be ready to choose the correct procedure, whether it's a confidence interval or a significance test for means or proportions. If you're not sure, practice using apps or inference summary from your book. Don't enter data into your calculator just because it's there. Oftentimes you're given a graph, summary, statistics, or even a computer output that already has what you need and you'll save valuable time by not unnecessarily entering data into your calculator. Next, make sure you only interpret the p-value or the confidence level if the question specifically asks you to. Otherwise, just stick to writing the conclusion in context. Remember, if you add more information than is asked for, it may hinder your score. Another thing you can do to save time is to use your calculator for the do step and just report the key results such as the interval endpoints or test statistic, degrees of freedom, and p-value. 
as long as you name the procedure, you should be okay. But there is a risk involved because if you enter something incorrectly into your calculator and get the wrong numerical value, you can't get partial credit for the math that isn't there. Don't fight the question. What we mean by this is if the conditions are met and it says that in the setup to the problem, accept it and move on. You don't have to waste time checking those conditions. If you get stuck on a calculation, make up a reasonable value. Just stay within the bounds. For example, a p-value is always going to be between 0 and 1, and use those to write the complete conclusion. Now, you might lose credit for the wrong p-value, but if you use that incorrect value correctly in your conclusion, you won't lose additional points there. Also, in your conclusion, make sure you're using statistical language, like we are 95% confidence, or there is convincing evidence that. Make sure it connects to the parameters, the population, and a response variable in context. Some final thoughts here. This test is hard. It's typically going to be harder than a normal classroom test, but it is curved. Usually scoring at least 45% will almost guarantee a three or higher on the exam. Stay calm. Don't panic if you can't answer a question or two. Move on and then come back to it later. If a question is hard, it's going to be hard for everyone, and the cut scores are going to reflect that and be adjusted for that fact. Also, I want you to walk into test day confident. You've got this. Well, that's it, guys. If you found this helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and drop a comment with any last-minute AP stats questions. Good luck on the exam, and make sure you share this with a friend of yours who also needs help on the AP stats free response questions. Take care.